You know, this, uh, this issue uh, uh, wasn't something that I, uh, I dreamt up while I was mayor. I, I experienced the problem of illegal immigration firsthand, and I, uh, I think it's more obvious uh, in a small town like Hazleton, which was a population of 30,000, uh, because you can see the changes in the community and how illegal immigration actually affects a city such as ours, uh, for example, uh, the wait time in the emergency room uh, grew to seven, eight, nine hours uh, as, as illegal uh, uh, aliens are using the emergency room for primary health care. Our population in Hazleton grew by 50%, which is a huge growth of a, of a city, but yet our tax revenue remained the same. So it became very difficult uh, for us in trying to provide services uh, to, to the people in the city with, without the revenue growth with, that was growing with the population. So it affects the, the quality of life in our city. We began seeing crimes increase, and it was during the investigation of those crimes uh, that we, were, we found out that we had a problem with illegal immigration. More times than not, in the investigation, we found out that the person involved was in the country illegally. Uh, I came down to Washington in December uh, 2005, met with the Department of Justice to ask for help. I didn't know how to deal with it as a small town mayor. Uh, we had great meetings. They, they brought in all these experts to talk to me, and uh, at the end of the day, I got this nice coffee mug, I got a lapel pin, um, I got a pat on the back, and then the coffee mug is in my office in D.C. If, in case you, I, I keep it with me as a reminder of, uh, of the failure of the federal government. Uh, and then May 10th, 2006, a day I'll never forget. Derek Kishline, a 29-year-old father of three young children um, while working on his pickup truck in Hazleton, had some words with Pedro Cabrera. Pedro Cabrera was in the country illegally, arrested six times in New York City's and other cities uh, before he came to Hazleton, New York City being another sanctuary city. Cabrera didn't like... Uh, what Kishline had to say, went into his car, got a gun, stuck it in Derek's face, and shot and killed him, point blank. Uh, we spent half of our yearly budget and overtime in the police department in finding and catching Cabrera and his buddy. Uh, our police department worked 36 straight hours until we, until we got him. Uh, I sat with Mr. and Mrs. Kishline and tried to answer the question is why was this man still in the country when he had been arrested before? Derek, Derek Kishline should, should have been alive today, and Pedro Cabrera should not have been in the country, had it not been for a sanctuary city, not enforcing the law. That began my crusade against sanctuary cities. I began speaking around Pennsylvania, and I remember going to central Pennsylvania at a town hall meeting, and at the end of the meeting, a young couple came up to me, and they said that they drove an hour to, to hear me speak. They wanted to tell me about their daughter. Her name was Carly Snyder. She was 20 years old, studying to be a veterinarian. Her next door neighbor was in the country illegally from Honduras. He had been arrested in Houston prior to coming to Pennsylvania, another sanctuary city. Uh, the man broke in Carly's house, as the father told me, a tear uh, was coming down his cheek. He stabbed his daughter 37 times. Carly had knife wounds in the palms of her hand, and she had knife wounds in her back as she bled to death on the kitchen floor. He told me that I'm speaking for Carly now, and that's why he wanted to come to see me. I can't forget that. I can't forget the time with Derek Kishline family and the story of Carly Snyder. So I come to Washington and I first thing I do is I introduce a bill, mobilizing against sanctuary cities. The bill would cut all funding, all funding, federal funding, to any city that declares itself a sanctuary city. See, I created the first law in the country on a municipal level, uh, dealing with illegal immigration, and I was sued by illegal aliens uh, for doing so. Uh, the ACLU said that they would bankrupt our city if I didn't back down, which I, which I didn't. And it, uh, it was hard for me to, to comprehend how a mayor is sued for wanting to enforce federal laws and yet there are 200 mayors around the country who believe they are kings and will pick and choose what laws uh, they will enforce. Creating safe havens for illegal aliens to take the lives of others like Kate Steinle, 
Um, you know, how many murders, how many innocent people need to be murdered before we stop the don't ask, don't tell policies dealing with illegal immigration? And that's what it really has become. See, when, when we talked about don't ask, don't tell, it always had a different meaning. But when we apply it to illegal immigration, many walk away. They don't want to hear that. And, uh, you know, as I, uh, I relive the, uh, the past of, of the Derek Kishlines and, and, and the Kate Steinleys and the Carly Snyders, you know, I have to ask myself, doesn't every life matter? Isn't, isn't that what we've been told, that every life matters? Uh, I don't believe the Steinley family saw anybody from, from the White House at their daughter's funeral. Uh, what, what does it take until we finally stand up uh, and, and, and protect the American people? That's what we have immigration laws for, to protect the American people and to protect American jobs. So I'm going to continue to pursue uh, all that I can, not only with the bills that I've introduced. I reintroduced the bill again. And hopefully, uh, unfortunately, because of the attention that it's gotten uh, from, from what's happened in San Francisco, that Congress will have the backbone to finally stand up and, and uh, enforce the laws uh, of, of the country. So uh, with that, I'm going to I'll stop. And Thank you, Congressman. Are there are any questions? I had questioned myself. Uh, but what do you think the prospect of getting this law passed? Uh, I think it's probably better now than, than ever. Uh, there, there are there are a number of uh, uh, there are a few different sanctuary city bills. Uh, mine cuts all funding. Being a former mayor, and experience uh, what it's like to be a mayor, it has to have teeth in it. And the best way to do it to get a mayor's attention is to cut all federal funding, uh, because if it's not tough enough, you know, there's one thing Congress can do. We can yell and scream and. Uh, and, and you know, get our names in the newspaper by things we want to say all the time. But what we can do, really can do, is control the purse strings. We control the money. And if we really want to stop sanctuary cities, the law has to be tough, and it has to be meaningful that mayors will not even consider uh, you know, becoming a sanctuary city. So uh, I'm hoping now more than ever, and, and uh, the best thing we can do is, is uh, get our, my colleagues uh, around the country to uh, to get on board, co-sponsor the bill, and, and uh, ask leadership to put it on the floor. I had a question, Congressman, uh, uh, and you sort of, you may want to dance around the uh, question, feel free if necessary, but why hasn't leadership pushed this? In other words, why wasn't this passed uh, a week after the new Congress was sworn in? You know, there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons, I, I believe. Um, and I can't say it, it's one reason more than, than the other. Number one, I found since, uh, since I'm in, in Congress a short time, this is only my fifth year, but there's been a reluctance to pass any type of immigration laws, any kind of immigration bills. I have a biometric entry and exit. You know, following the 9-11 Commission report, it was clear they recommended to Congress to, that we should have a biometric entry and exit so that we know who comes in and out of the country. Seems pretty simple. Uh, everyone in Congress seems to want to secure the borders. Democrat, Republican, Senate, and House, I don't know why we haven't. I don't know why we need something more. There's, that's the lowest fruit on the tree, secure the borders. Everyone claims they want to do that. We can't even do that. Because when we start talking about securing the borders, then there's always a pathway to citizenship, or there's, there's more to it. And uh, so, so part of the reason is, is I believe there's a lack of will to, to go forward with any type of immigration laws. Second is there's also uh, many who believe that any vehicle, immigration vehicle that we pass in the House will be used in the Senate uh, as, as a vehicle for, um, for a pathway to citizenship or some other immigration law. So uh, there's been a real reluctance to move forward with, with any, uh, any immigration laws. Um, do you think, so there's over 11 million undocumented folks in the country. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, th there's not enough resources to be able to deport all of them, and not all of them are criminals who are killing individuals. So do you find yourself ever thinking about passing some sort of immigration reform so that we can weave out all the undocumented immigrants who are here to just do harm and who are felons? Because that way would be able to really pick who is here and who is committing felonies and be able to get rid of them and okay. then deal with the other millions of individuals who aren't committing felonies? That's a real good question. And, and it usually comes up all the time as, well, what are we going to do with the 11 million? Uh, 
That's usually how the conversations usually go, at least with me anyway, when people uh, talk to me about it. And, and my answer is, is, is pretty clear, and, and maybe it's not the answer people want to hear. But if we're going to deal with this issue, and I believe there's many more than 11 million, uh, I don't, you know, where that number came from, nobody can count who's here illegally because they don't all stand up to be counted. However, the first thing we need to do is secure the border so that that number doesn't change. Because as soon as you begin to have a conversation about what you're going to do about the others that are here, you send a signal to people around the world that now is the time to come. If, if we talk about a pathway to citizenship and we're just going to deport those who committed crimes, we, and we know this for a fact that people begin to flood the border uh, to come into the United States before we secure the border. So I'm reluctant to, to say anything more than let's secure the border first. And that's not only our southern border and northern border. Nearly 50% of the people that come into the country illegally, they don't cross a border illegally. They come on a visa, and the visa expires, and then we can't find them. So nearly half of the people that are here aren't what we you know, the picture in our mind, the perception of, of somebody running across the Mexican border into the United States isn't really the case. In fact, that's a preferred method of entry into the country by terrorists is to come on a visa. So, so my position on how to deal with illegal immigration is to secure the borders, airports, seaports, uh, enforce the laws we have. I don't believe our immigration laws were broken. I believe we began to uh, break the laws by not enforcing them, which creates the problem. So, so my answer is secure the border, enforce the laws that we have, and then we can then have the conversation of what we're going to do with, with the people that are here. It's not always the answer people want to hear, but I believe that's the best way not to make a bad situation worse. Yeah, let's take two more. You, you and then you. Should. Yeah, go ahead, man. Um, Brittany Hughes with CNS News. Um, I've looked into a number of cases in which an illegal alien was convicted of certain crimes. Um, one of the most difficult things to do and one of the most time-consuming things to do in reporting these stories is to find out whether the individual was, in fact, illegally in this country. Um, should local, state, and federal authorities be required to disclose whether or not an individual was illegally in the country? when they are arrested for certain crimes? And if so, is that something that Congress can do or have any impact on? I believe they should. Uh, you know, it, it, that's a crime in itself. So I, I don't believe government should cover up or hide uh, any crime that a person ha has committed. I believe that the public has the right to know uh, the status of that person if, in fact, they know that that person's in the country illegally. Not to do so begins to open that door for a sanctuary city by, by hiding the, the, the immigration status of, of a person that has committed another crime. Uh, and I absolutely believe that that should be included uh, if and so they know, in fact, they know that that person's in the country illegally. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, um, Sean Higgins with the uh, Washington Examiner. This is in response to your uh, statement earlier about um, the fear that if legislation is moved in the House, that the Senate will do uh, something differently. Is that just a, a fear, or can you point to instances where legislation was introduced and companion bill in the Senate or, or legislation in the Senate went off in some very different direction? <laughs> yeah, I'm a perfect example. I passed protecting volunteer firefighters three times. It seems like a no-brainer. Uh, there was a question whether volunteer... This liability issue? Uh, oh, it, this, that's okay. This, there was a question that whether volunteer firefighters had to... Uh, comply with the Affordable Care Act and be provided health insurance or pay a $3,000 fine because in the IRS code, tax code, volunteer firefighters are listed as employees for federal tax purposes. So the question, that question came up. So I passed a law that would exempt volunteer firefighters because 87% of firefighters in America are volunteers. And we all know that that would close firehouses if they had to provide health insurance or pay a fine. The bill passed unanimously in the House, 417 to nothing. But I mean, specific to anything introduced. With immigration? To immigration. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of what immigration bills we passed. Uh, it's not not a heck of a lot. Uh, and and whether or not that fear is real or not, I can't say. I um, I'm not one of those who who uh, w 
who was fearful of passing an immigration law because of that reason. But I can tell you there, there were uh, members on, on the House side that, that feared that, that feared any type of immigration law would be used as a vehicle. So whether or not uh, it's a fear or a reality, I can't, uh, I can't confirm that. The firefighters it, went, it went over. It went over. To, it passed unanimously. Went over to the Senate, and Harry Reid changed the name of my name of the bill was protecting volunteer firefighters. The U.S. The new name of the bill was extending unemployment compensation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Harry Reid. Uh, so then we took the Senate, and I thought, well, this is great. I'll pass it again. It passed unanimously the second time. Uh, went over to the Senate, and the bill became. Uh, funding the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> so then I passed it a third time. I believe I set a record for the most bills passed in the House unanimously. Not one person <laughs> voted against it. It went to the Senate. Believe it or not, it was changed again a third time. I just introduced it for the fourth time. I'm going for a world record. Lou Gehrig and Cal Ripken have nothing over the protecting volunteer firefighters. <laughs>